did contemplate momentarily whether we should commence this study with a, a musical excerpt from Handel's Messiah. Um, those of us that are familiar with that will realise that the title that we're to consider today, The Prince of Peace, is, is at the end of perhaps one of the most rousing of choruses within that oratorio. Of course, Handel had nothing to do with the words. Uh, he simply uh, put them to music, put the inspired words, as we've just seen from reading from Isaiah chapter 9. And I'm not sure to what extent uh, Handel knew uh, what, what the, the words that he was putting to music, what, how much he knew about them, how much he understood about them. Uh, but he certainly picked some words that had some great context, momentous events in the purpose of God. There's so much in these words. Uh, let's just read again those uh, two verses, Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even for ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's probably obvious even just from a superficial reading of those words, isn't it? That this peace contemplated by the prophet Isaiah here has far more significance than even just simply a reference to the birth of Christ and his life upon the earth as it was 2,000 years ago. As Jesus was the Prince of Peace in more ways than one, and that's what we want to consider today. Yes, certainly it has reference to the kingdom, and we shall come to that. Uh, but there's, there's more, I think, to it uh, than that. So what we hope to do today, we don't really want to just, it's not going to be a study of, of this section of Isaiah or anything like that. We just want to look at this, this title and consider how it refers to Jesus. Uh, so our agenda in doing that is uh, just some words of introduction, which is this bit. And then we want to look at some etymology, just a brief a look at the history, uh, a look at the, um, the context, the origin uh, of the words we're reading English words Prince of Peace but obviously it comes from the Hebrew uh, to look at that and then just consider the subject in three sections in relation uh, uh, to Christ uh, the fact that peace has been shattered that's the need for a pre Prince of Peace uh, and then this section on making peace how Jesus uh, has restored peace uh, and then the abundance of peace how that ultimately because of what Jesus has achieved uh, there is this opportunity to receive this abundance of peace in the latter days. <clears throat> so first of all then, the, uh, just looking at the words uh, for a moment or two, um, as I say, Prince of Peace obviously is a, the English words. We need to look at the, the Hebrew really to see if there's any further understanding for us in these things. And so in the Hebrew, it's the two words, Sar Shalom. The word Sar being the uh, translation of that we have of, of prince uh, and if we look at the, the Hebrew uh, of this word sar we find it's a, a common word it appears 421 times uh, in the King James version 208 times it's translated prince 130 captain 33 chief and, and so on as we can hopefully see on the screen and Song's uh, definition of that word is that it means it refers to a head person of any rank or class, a captain that had rule, chief captain, general, governor, keeper, lord, taskmaster, principal, ruler and steward. Uh, and it's always a briefer explanation in, in Young's Concordance. Uh, he has head, official, captain. <clears throat> so that's this word, sar, this word, uh, prince, translated prince. And then when we're looking in that, in the in the concordance, we notice that there are a lot of other Hebrew words, quite a number of other Hebrew words that are also translated prince. Um, so we just put one of them, the next most common, uh, which is this Hebrew word norsi, uh, which appears uh, 132 times. And again, translated quite a lot of times, prince, 96 times prince, 12 times captain, and so on. And the definition of that is as an exalted one. That is a king or a sheikh. So that is a word 
perhaps more so uh, than uh, the Tsar, that refers to uh, a king or uh, to a, a prince in the sense of uh, a natural successor to a throne, so to speak. So this word Tsar doesn't seem to be uh, in that context. It's not the prince in a regal sense. Um, <coughs> so let's move on uh, to the word peace. Uh, it's a, a word that we're probably familiar with, shalom. It appears 175 times as it's translated peace. Uh, other words as well, you can read those for yourselves. Not really much to say about that, but it is just this word meaning uh, peace and completeness and well. And if we were to look at this uh, verse in Isaiah chapter 9 in a search tool such as Bible Hub, it shows you 20 translations on one page and every translation, all the most common translations, translate that phrase, Prince of Peace. So it seems we're pretty safe with those words. There's no real additional explanation required really. It's simply a reference to the fact that Jesus is a a captain, he's a chief of peace. And that's really uh, the principle behind it. But while we're looking at words for a moment, uh, perhaps also mention here that there appears to be an equivalent Greek word uh, to this um, word sar, and it's the Greek word archegos. So as Tsar, this Hebrew word Tsar, it's translated prince and captain, this Greek word archegos is also translated prince and captain. It only appears four times in scripture, but I think they're quite significant. They're quite, it's quite interesting, I think, if we have a quick look at them. The first one is in Acts chapter 3 and verse 15. They're all fairly short statements, so we'll just turn quickly to them as they're close together. Uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 15. Because uh, they all have reference to Christ um, and seem to sum up this aspect of Jesus as Prince of Peace that we're looking at. Um, so Acts chapter 3, verse 15. So Peter, when he's preaching to the people concerning Jesus, we can see that in the context in verse 13, speaking of Jesus, he says, they, the people killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. So there's this reference to Christ as being the, the prince of life, the chief leader, the, the captain of life. We've on a couple of chapters to the second one in Acts chapter 5, and verse 31. Peter again, in referring to Jesus... <laughs> Verse 31 says, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So a prince and a saviour. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, and verse 2. Perhaps uh, remember that, perhaps without even turning there. It's a familiar uh, verse looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that word author there is this word archegos, this prince, prince and finisher of our faith, we might uh, read that. And then finally in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, probably don't need to refer to it, um, it's familiar to us. Again, speaking of Jesus, uh, as the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings, captain of salvation. So we have these phrases here, the prince of life, a prince and a saviour, author of faith or prince of faith, we might say, and prince of salvation. And perhaps in that, last phrase there in Hebrews 2 verse 10 this prince of salvation I think perhaps that is in a nutshell the equivalent of this Hebrew phrase this Hebrew title that we're considering um, prince of peace I think in the, in the New Testament it would be captain of salvation and so all these I think really those four four references in the New Testament um, 
really capture what we're looking at today in this title of Prince of Peace, or certainly one aspect of it. <clears throat> and so in other words, we might say Jesus is the chief leader, the principal leader in things relating to life and salvation. That's what I take uh, from looking at those few verses as a, a cross-reference, really, to this Prince of Peace. So this hugely important and absolutely essential role of the Lord Jesus Christ, we think, as this captain of salvation, is also tied up in this simple phrase, Prince of Peace. And so the question really, I think, we want to consider as we go on is how Jesus, how exactly he deserves that title. And in a sense, I think there's a two-stage accomplishment of what is suggested in that title in relation to Jesus. There's first a preliminary accomplishment in his life upon this earth, and then secondly, the, the full accomplishment, as it were, at his second coming in the future. It's what he achieved first that led to that uh, the full accomplishment of this Prince of Peace that we might might be what we first read and think of when we read that passage in Isaiah chapter 9 but I think there's more to it than just that so let's move on then to consider this aspect of peace being shattered why why there's a need for the Prince of Peace in the first place just briefly we'll just look at a few passages in this connection just a, a few thoughts just to remind ourselves really because in the first place we're told, these are two verses we're familiar with in Genesis, we're told that everything that was made, created by God, was very good. And that Adam and Eve were created in his image. There's two passages there, Genesis 1 verse 27, that God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And Genesis 31, that 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And so we might say that there were all the attributes to make a peaceful relationship with God possible. And the man and the woman were at perfect peace with God in a fruitful garden, in complete <coughs> innocence, enjoying the dominion that he had given them over the creation of his hand. It was a basis for a peaceful relationship. But of course we know that was all spoilt. The relationship was spoilt by the fall of Adam and Eve, by their disobedience of God's command. And we see sin enter and everything changes. And so it is that a, a breach is opened up between God and mankind <coughs> that needed to be repaired. Sin had separated mankind from God and it prevents him from living in peace with God. There's effectively a barrier between them, between God and mankind, and it continues to be there as the natural portion of human life today. And so we might say then that the real reason for the lack of peace on earth is found in Eden when war was effectively instituted. And God said in Genesis 3 verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. <clears throat> God put enmity. It's also the Hebrew word for enmity is also translated hatred. It was there in the beginning, between the seed of the serpent and the seed <coughs> of the woman. And so it is then that enmity between good and evil, between righteousness and wickedness is the unalterable appointment of God and will never cease from the earth until wickedness comes, uh, wickedness is removed. And so whilst this situation of broken peace exists, this broken relationship between God and sinful man, there can be no peace. We just quickly whiz through these four references here. We went, turned to them, um, probably familiar, Isaiah 57 verse 21. God said, there is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. And just in a very simple analogy, perhaps, we see that in this reference in the second book of Kings in chapter 9. <coughs> um, and Jehoram says, 
is it peace, Jehu? Uh, Jehu? And what peace, said Jehu, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother, Jezebel, and her witchcrafts are so many? There can be no peace when wickedness persists. And it's in God's hand only to make peace on earth. As he said in Isaiah 45, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do these things. The world will not know peace apart from its establishment at the hands of the one who God has appointed to do so, the one who he appointed as the Prince of Peace. And that true peace needed to be taught by one man in particular that God provided. As the Apostle Peter revealed in speaking to Cornelius in these words in Acts chapter 10, verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. So, how then has the <coughs> Prince of Peace preached peace? How has he lived up to his mission, lived up to his name, up to this title, Prince of Peace? Well, let's move on then to consider that section of making peace, how peace has been restored by the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> peace, of course, comes from unity, and Jesus' mission is a mission of peace. And that's what we're considering, we're considering him and his essential character as the Prince of Peace. But all that, that peace has to come through unity, through the unity that he'll establish between God and man. Now we're familiar with this, aren't we, as a fundamental aspect of the gospel, that reconciliation, that's what that word means, isn't it? It's about bringing peace, bringing agreement back between God and man. And that has been achieved in Jesus, as the Apostle Paul explained. And it's perhaps that word reconciliation that we more think of when we think about this concept of of, of, in Jesus' life in reconciling us to God uh, for instance in the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 8 <clears throat> it's actually verse 18 actually I think that should be 18 and 19 uh, let's turn there actually 2 Corinthians 5 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation and so perhaps another way of looking at this principle of reconciliation is that Jesus has restored peace between God and man and it's actually amazing, I didn't realise it until I was looking at this subject. It's amazing how many references there are in Scripture to this, this principle of reconciliation that referred to as, as peace and with Jesus restoring peace. And that's really what we're going to do, just take a bit of a chronological look through some of them and to see how this is actually revealed throughout Scripture. From prophecy right through to, to the days of the Apostles. So let's start then with the prophets and the, some prophetic references in scripture that look forward to Christ as the Prince of Peace, although with slightly, not in that specific term, uh, but with slightly different connotations of peace mentioned. Uh, the first one is in Prophecy of Nahum, chapter 1. turn to some of these, we probably won't turn to all of them. Um, it's quite a few passages that we're going to be referring to, because of the nature of the subject really, but that's why we thought if we use the screen we can perhaps jump through some of them. Um, so Nahum uh, chapter 1, um, obviously the mo most of this prophecy in this chapter is uh, <coughs> a prophecy of Nineveh. 
But just at the very end, in the last verse, in verse 15, uh, he speaks of, of Judah. Judah is contrasted with uh, that of Nineveh that he's previously spoken about. And, and he says in verse 15, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. <clears throat> and so to Israel of old, it was revealed that one would come that would proclaim peace, that would publish peace. And that one, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ being referred to. We probably recognise those words, but as I say, I didn't, hadn't really realised how many references there are uh, in referring to Christ as this one that would publish peace and bring peace. Uh, Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah uh, chapter 52. Uh, it's very similar language because he's speaking of the same time. Um, but he just slightly <coughs> extends this reference uh, to peace. So it's Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, Thus saith, that saith unto Zion thy God, Rainus. So there's this clear link here, isn't there, with the fact that this publishing of peace is related to salvation. It's this reconciliation. It's this um, fixing of this uh, broken relationship between God and man by the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. <clears throat> and in the next chapter, in Isaiah chapter 53, the prophet Isaiah foretold God's righteousness and his extension of his mercy to sinners when he wrote the familiar words uh, in Isaiah 53 uh, and verse 5 he was wounded speaking of Jesus of course he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed it's perhaps slightly more uh, effective, better put perhaps by the ESV this verse where we read uh, that last phrase is upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace so the fact that we can have peace with God is on the Lord Jesus Christ he has brought us peace and of course we're indebted to him for that as we're uh, well aware well, the prophecies of Jesus as this bringer of peace continue into the New Testament uh, in Luke chapter 1. Uh, at the birth of John the Baptist, his father Zacharias prophesied. And the end of that prophecy refers to the way of peace that Jesus would bring. <coughs> Let's just remind ourselves of, of that. Uh, in Luke chapter 1, uh, verse Let's pick up at verse 76. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. That's what the one that John was to go before was to do. He would, the Lord Jesus Christ was coming to guide our feet into the way of peace, to show us uh, the way to peace with God. Uh, move on a chapter in Luke chapter 2. This, again, we'll probably be familiar when we look at these things, but when the birth of Christ was announced by the angels, they rejoiced in the prospect of the peace that he would bring. Uh, it's a short verse, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Perhaps some of the most oft misunderstood uh, and misquoted words uh, for most people. They're not, of course, just predicting uh, a peaceful time, at a, a, what tends to be a fairly peaceful time of the year because everyone's happy. Um, no, of course, the angels were proclaiming the birth of Jesus Christ and the prospect that he was the one that could ultimately bring peace to those 
who uh, show goodwill to God, to bring that He would bring peace and reconciliation to those men and women uh, with whom He is pleased. Again, perhaps that sense comes out better in the ESV that reads, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So this peace that was to come through the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to those with whom God is pleased. <clears throat> well, Jesus continued the same message himself. Uh, we perhaps won't that's time going um, well let's just turn to John they're both in John so they're not far apart are they let's turn to John 14 let's catch up with ourselves uh, John 14 verse 27 So using similar terms himself during his ministry, he spoke of the peace that he would achieve. So saying to his disciples in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Yeah, this peace that Jesus was to give is nothing that anyone else could give. The world couldn't achieve this. This was a, something special. It involves reconciliation to God. Uh, and we know uh, what was uh, special about Christ that achieved that, that it had to be uh, by a, a sinless man. And we find similar sentiments expressed by Jesus a couple of chapters on in John chapter 16, John 16 verse 33 These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world so these things I have spoken he says all the things that have gone before all his preaching uh, that's referred to in that chapter of the gospel the good news of the gospel he's provided that through him his true disciples might have peace it's an interesting list, isn't it, that we're building up. All these references, these prophecies to Jesus bringing peace, publishing peace, guiding us in the way of peace, leaving us with peace, that we might have peace. And it's something that the apostles continued. They continued to proclaim peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul uh, spoke of peace through Jesus. Uh, it's in Romans chapter 5. Let's turn there. But in doing so, he makes a very interesting link back to that first offence that shattered peace in the first place. It's in Romans chapter 5, verse 19. It's a familiar verse, probably, to us. Let's, let's read it again, so I think it links in nicely with uh, the things that we're talking about. Romans 5 verse 19 For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous and Of course there's reference there isn't there to Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ the two that are referred to And so here really is confirmation of the point that we're, we've made isn't it that peace departed from the earth in connection with Adam's offence many were made sinners but we can add, very importantly, that peace returns because of our Lord Jesus Christ's obedience. And I think that's the whole point that Paul is making here in this chapter. And so in the opening of the chapter, he makes direct reference to peace coming through Jesus upon all those who believe in him and understand uh, this problem of this, why peace was broken and how it's going to be fixed. So Romans 5 verse 1 Therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein ye stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
So here then is the it's true basis of peace. It's the humble recognition of the will of God in Jesus Christ. And Paul makes several allusions to the peace with God that has been restored through Jesus, that he perhaps starts this building this argument here in Romans and continues it in writing to the Ephesians and also to the Colossians. Let's just look quickly uh, at those or refer to them. So Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Very interesting reference here because he's referring uh, to them, to the Ephesians as Gentiles, how they were far off. Uh, alienated effectively as Gentiles in a hopeless state until that was remedied in Christ. Uh, so Ephesians 2 verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, so referring to Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity even a law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So he is our peace, Paul said. He's made peace. And here's a specific reference to us, isn't it, as Gentiles ourselves peace created by the Lord Jesus Christ is twofold in that sense isn't it that first of all Jew and Gentile are united and then as one both are reconciled to God through Jesus the enmity having been slain and Paul continues that message of peace in writing to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1 and this is the last reference for this section uh, in Colossians chapter 1 uh, and verse 19 <coughs> for it pleased the Father that in him speaking of Jesus in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. And so again there's this link here, isn't there, with reconciliation through Christ and uh, peace, uh, having made peace. So uh, again, it's clearly identifiable. Aspect of the gospel is that the apostles taught this message of peace, ministered the word of reconciliation, showing men and women how that God had made provision for their rebellious nature, that they might return to his favour through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think that's the preliminary aspect of this title of Prince of Peace, how Christ has achieved that <coughs> title in order that the, that the ultimate peace might be achieved in time still future, the abundance of peace that will ultimately be achieved in the latter day revival of God's people. <clears throat> and nothing can be clearer really than the f we think than the fact that the peace that the Lord Jesus Christ will bring about and maintain maintain was defined by the prophets as a time far removed from their days it was always associated with this future latter day deliverance and uh, revival of the nation of Israel so let's look at uh, this aspect then as we uh, bring our thoughts to a close uh, this ab abundance of peace uh, Psalm 85 first of all Let's pick up at the beginning of the, the psalm. I, 
Lord, thou hast been favourable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us for ever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. So here's a prophecy of the day when God will revive Israel, when he'll show mercy and grant salvation, when he'll speak peace to his people. <clears throat> and ultimately, the result will be that mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace kiss. The kiss is, of course, the expression of affection and unity. And so here is the true and final effect of reconciliation through Christ, when peace will go with God will truly have been achieved through his Son, the Prince of Peace. No more enmity and separation because of sin, but peace and agreement and salvation. Let's come back uh, a few pages to Psalm 72. <clears throat> Where we read further of this absolute peace that's to be established by the Lord Jesus Christ in, in the kingdom. Uh, if you have the same um, Oxford Bible as me, you might have the header above, which I think is quite appropriate. Above this psalm it says, David praying for Solomon showeth the goodness and glory of his kingdom in type and of Christ's in truth. Yeah, this is speaking of Christ's kingdom in, in truth, first and foremost. Uh, so Psalm 72 verse 1, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon mown grass, as showers that water <coughs> the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ will bring peace to the people, an abundance of peace. It's a, it's a lovely phrase really, isn't it? Abundance of peace. I don't know if you can get more peaceful than an abundance of peace. But it prevents a marvellous picture, doesn't it? A picture of a relationship with Israel and in the earth generally that is completely changed from the situation that we know now. <clears throat> but of course we know that that peace will not just be handed to the Lord Jesus as he, as he returns. There will be a, a, a time of a complete opposite to peace, of course. Rather, the nations are to be subdued by this Prince of Peace in order that that universal peace might be achieved. Let's just turn to Micah chapter 5. <clears throat> in which we learn of Christ's role at uh, this time another prophecy we're drawn to it by this thread of peace that's used in these passages <coughs> uh, Micah chapter 5 probably familiar with it um, certainly with the um, verse 2 often quoted uh, as a prophecy of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ but it continues to speak of his future role uh, let's just pick up in verse 4 uh, speaking of 
the one that's to be ruler in Israel, earlier in the, the chapter, verse 4, he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth, and this man shall be the peace when the Assyrians shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. So the Lord Jesus is to be the peace in the day of war when the the latter day Assyrian, also known as Gog, shall be broken on the mountains of Israel and Israel shall be delivered as these things these prophecies speak to us of. Let's look at just a couple more. Let's come with me to Haggai chapter 2. Where the prophet is speaking here to encourage the people in the building of the temple in Jerusalem after the turning from the captivity. And he looks towards the kingdom age and contrasts the incomparable glory of the temple in, in that day to come. And he says in Haggai chapter 2, verse 6, starting at verse 6, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 9, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place, Will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. In Jerusalem, in this place, in Jerusalem, in Israel, will I give peace. We know that's the locality of this time of blessing. And if we were in any doubt as to the, when that prophecy is referring to, it's quoted by the Apostle in writing to the Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, when speaking of the establishment of that kingdom that cannot be moved. Well, our uh, penultimate reference, I think it is, is from Psalm 122. And David's prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, we're familiar with that. It forms one of our hymns, isn't it, the words of this. But I love passages of scripture in which we find a, a direct reference to ourselves. You can think that's referring to me, to us. For example, in the Lord Jesus Christ, he referred, uh, it's in John, isn't it, to other sheep I have that are not of this fold, referring to the Gentiles, to think that he was thinking of us as those other sheep. And I think there's a similar thing in this psalm, and I hadn't picked up on it until recently, but in connection with David, of course, where he's thinking of us in connection with the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, so Psalm 122, and verse 6, he says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, they shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, Peace be within thee. So what a marvellous prayer that is, praying for the peace of Jerusalem. But David wasn't just thinking of himself, he didn't want it just for himself. He was thinking of his brethren and his companions, with whom he would share it. And he prayed for their sakes also those that would share that peace with him and that's you and I (coughs) brethren and sisters if we are found worthy of it so what a marvellous situation we are in brethren and sisters that the Lord Jesus Christ has achieved peace with God for us that the environment of absolute peace to be created upon this earth upon his return to earth is for us to enjoy And we look forward to sharing it with the likes of David and other worthies of old as our brethren and companions. And so through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, we live in hope of enjoying those many wonderful pleasures of the future age of peace as princes ourselves 
in fact, as depicted by the wonderful words of Isaiah 32, with which we'll close. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. It's the first verse, verse 16. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in a fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance for ever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Well, God willing, brothers and sisters, that peaceable habitation will be with us soon.